First, we honor God today for this is the day that the Lord has made and we rejoice and we are glad in it. We honor God for God's excellent greatness. But most of all, we honor God because God is God and beside him there is no other. To Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum for her sisterhood and friendship and leadership, I thank you for your very kind invitation to share your pulpit this evening, even if only virtually. And I am greatly honored and deeply humbled to be with all of you at CBST. To all who have gathered with us, whether in person or virtually, I pray that the Lord will continue to bless your life and that you will continue to do as our King brother King David did, and that is dance before the Lord with all your might. Many of you know that I am a fifth generation pastor, uh, so we are a long-standing family of the faithful, family of the observant, uh, family of the devoted. And uh, every year, my father would gather us for what became a family tradition. We would sit before the television and watch the Ten Commandments. Yes, that Ten Commandments, the one with Charlton Heston. Now, I know all the cultural problems and the fact that Charlton Heston is playing Moses is problematic in and of itself. I understand that. But I just try to focus on the essential essence of the story. And it is a movie that I still watch every year at that time of year. And I call all of my sisters and my brother and I say, hey, the Ten Commandments is on. And we all stop and we watch the Ten Commandments. But the essential essence of the story uh, and the story upon which that movie is built reminds us that the sacred texts are meant to be more than just recited and retold. For if our God is yesterday, today, and forevermore, then the word of our God is intended to be a living, breathing, everlasting document that is always relevant and meaningful with principles that are to be lived and applied to our lives today in the place that we live, even so many thousands of years after it was committed to manuscript. And it's within that context that I want to share some thoughts with you today. For I believe that in the story of the children of Israel, their suffering and deliverance, we can find some relevance for our lives, even though none of us is in bondage today. Well, at least not physically. And even if there is no ruler whose every decision impacts every area of our lives, at least not one named Pharaoh. As I reread the story, I am always struck by a couple of things. First, here we have a community of the faithful, God's own people, who despite their faithfulness find themselves in an untenable situation of horrific proportions under the mercurial authority of one not of their faith and seemingly locked into a destiny that is at odds with the destiny that God had promised to them. We have every indication that this was a worshiping, observant community, one that is keeping their covenant with their God in the ways that they knew to keep it. And yet, this is my second point. In bringing their deliverance, God asked them to do something that God had never asked before. God asked them to take the blood of a lamb and paint it on their doorposts, on the outside of their doorposts. God says that when God sees the blood, God will surely pass over the household. Now surely, God is God and God knows all things. So surely God didn't really need the sign of the blood to know who was observant and who wasn't. And certainly God's purpose could have been accomplished with blood painted on the inside of the doorpost or through the performance of a ritual or a ceremony carried out inside the house. But no, God asked them to take 
a very public action to make known to anyone passing by their commitment to their principles the obedience to God's command. I submit that the painting of the doorpost was as much for the people and their neighbors as it was for God. God was asking them to make a public display of commitment, a public display of covenant, a public display of holiness so that their commitment to their faith, their commitment to their principles would mirror God's own commitment to them. How many of you know that sometimes you got to take an action? Sometimes you got to do something. God was about to bring to pass radical change in their lives and in their circumstances. God was about to force the greater community to be in alignment with God's own principles of freedom and liberty and self-determination. In short, God was about to bring holiness to the world as they knew it. In saying holiness, I do not mean that God was going to force everyone to be in covenant or that God was going to require that everyone worship as the children of Israel worshiped. What I mean rather is God was about to impose God's own principles on a society, on a community, on a nation that for too long had operated outside the realm of community, outside the realm of responsibility, outside the recognition and the consciousness that we are all equal in God's eyes and we therefore have a responsibility to one another. In bringing deliverance in such a dramatic and defining way as God did, God was sending a message, a message to Pharaoh, a message to the powers that be, that inequity and inequality and inhumanity were principles diametrically opposed to the character and the nature of the sovereign God. And barring action for man to right the wrongs, God's own self would intercede. And I believe God was sending a message to the children of Israel too. That private, personal holiness is good, but it is not enough. That the faithful have a responsibility, indeed an obligation, to make public their personal convictions, to bring their personal holiness, their principles, their values to the public square. Now, as many of you know, I am Pentecostal by tradition. And in the old days, we were known as holiness people. And we define holiness simply as being, as the quality of being like God, as much as we in our humanness can be like God. And we were taught that in everything we said and everything we did and in all the ways we acted, we were to strive as much as possible to reflect the image of God. But for too many of us, the concept of holiness was limited to our personal lives, what we did, what we said, what we wore, where we went. We thought that the more observant we were, then the longer our dresses, the longer we fasted, the longer we prayed. And then that meant the more holy we were and would become. And while I believe there is merit to a personal life that reflects God and Really, there's a mandate that our personal life reflects God. I am certainly grateful these days that I am allowed to wear pants, jewelry, and lipstick. I also believe that our God, our great and mighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, is as concerned about the quality of our private devotions, our prayer time, our study, our worship, and God is concerned about behavior and action in the public square. That is to say how God's principles and God's standards for our lives are being carried out in the public, in the community, in the nation. Yes, God desires truth in the inward parts and our internal attitudes ought to foster external exercises. Our internal attitudes ought to be reflected through our external exercises so that what we do and believe in private at our altars in our temples carries forward into how we behave and how we interact in public. 
This means I believe that God is concerned about how we love, care for, and treat each other. I believe that God cares about the children, all the children whether they live in observant families or not. I believe that God is concerned about how we are caring for the earth that God has given to us. I believe that God is concerned about how we treat the weak, the sick, and the old among us. I believe that God cares about how we treat the stranger who lives among us. I believe that God cares about those who have been persecuted, those who are being called out their name among us. I believe that God cares about economic disparity and unequal distribution of resources. I believe that God cares about unjust wars and the havoc that they wreak upon God's people's lives. I believe that God cares about hunger and homelessness. Homelessness. I believe that God cares about the people in Darfur, in Haiti, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in Palestine, in Tigray. I believe that God calls us to public holiness. God calls us to advocate for and create a society, a community, a nation that reflects God's own principles, God's own love, God's own goodness, God's own grace and mercy. And if the people of God won't do it, who will? This is public holiness. In this time, there are those who seek to define or to reduce our desire for public holiness, who wants to say God cares about prayer, but not about hunger, that God cares about worship, but not about clean water, that God cares about whether we love God, but not whether we love each other, that God cares about how we treat each other in our worship communities, but not how our nation treats us, how our neighbors treat us. For we, the faithful, the observant, Yes, God calls us to private, personal holiness. Yes, God wants a personal relationship with each of us. Yes, God wants us to pray and fast and worship. Yes, God wants us to be vibrant, authentic, accurate reflections of God's own self. But I submit that part of being this accurate reflection of God also requires us to be an accurate reflection of God in the public square as well. We cannot sit idly by as the people of God and allow injustice to happen. We must fight against it. We cannot simply pray for peace. We must work for it. We cannot fast for better communities. We must work to build them. We cannot pray for equality and dignity. We must also fight for it, advance it, defend it, and protect it. This, I believe, is the Passover story, a story of divine deliverance, yes, but even more than that, it is the story of a great and mighty God who cares so much for God's people that God would not have a holy people live in an unholy situation, so God creates the circumstances for change. God forces society to come into alignment with God's own values, and in doing so, God provides for us an example uh, to not simply have values, but to act upon them in private and in public, to take our deeply held values and bring them to life in the world, to practice private holiness in our hearts and minds and spirits in our places of worship and in our homes, and also, also to require public holiness in our society until it reflects the nature of our great and mighty God. God is not asking us to part the Red Sea or to get water from rocks, but God is asking us to pay attention, to decide to make a difference, to live our values, to get involved, to stand up, to speak out, to write a letter, to show up at a meeting, to write a check, to act up to complain loudly to get in the way of anything that is not like our God that stands in the way of our dignity of our wholeness of our wellness of justice of mercy of righteousness of self-determination get in the way we can see 
no dichotomy or difference between what is required of us privately and what is required of us publicly. What is required is to be a witness, God's witness to the world and God's messenger to the earth. What is required is to make our convictions public through decided action. What is required is for us to paint the outside of our doorposts. What does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. What does the Lord require? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Walk humbly with our God, with our God, with our God. The question for us is, where is God walking? Where is God walking? As we consider our society today, where is God walking? Is God walking with the privileged, with those who have much? Is God walking in places of whiteness? Is God walking in places that denigrate us because of who we love, how we love? Is God stepping over the homeless to get to the temple? Is God walking past the needy to get to the synagogue? Where is God walking? I believe that our God is walking where people have need, that our God walks with those who lack. That our God walks with those without clean water, without clean air. Our God is walking in places of displacement. I believe God walks in refugee camps. I believe God walks where the hurting can be found. I believe God walks in neighborhoods where there is no food, where there is no water, where there is no air. I believe God walks in places where there is no good school, where there is no community service, where there is no doctor, where there are no nurses. I believe God walks where the children are hurting, where the children are homeless. I believe God walks where the people panhandle, where the people cry out. I believe God walks with the people who are standing in line for hours to vote. I believe God walks with the people who can't vote, whose rights are being taken away. I believe God walks with the children who are finding themselves, the children who've been shamed, who've been denigrated, who've been called out of their name, who've been locked in the closet, who've been pushed in the closet. I believe God walks with all who have not been allowed to be themselves, to live their whole lives, to live out loud. That is where God walks. God walks where there is need. God walks where there is lack. God walks where there is hope. Lessness, where there is faithlessness, where the people's faith swings by a thread. That is where our God walks. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God, with our God, with our God. Where is God walking? And are you walking with God? So let it be written, so let it be done. The Lord bless you.